Nie wiem, no. Trzeba było, ale napisałam. Ja? 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 In my opinion and in my, let's say, imagination, I never saw the Middle East, Middle Eastern Europe or the Central Europe or whatever. However, this was what was discussed uh, most frequently uh, in intellectual debate. I, I always, I've always seen Eastern Europe, uh, and I always use this notion. Middle Eastern Europe, especially now, I don't know what it is. There is no single line that can match uh, Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, you know, Slovakia, whatever. You, you can observe it when you see the attitude towards what happens in Ukraine. This part of the Europe is even more, even more parted than any other part of Europe. So, so this, this is of course a sad fact, but it's a fact. And the tradition in this uh, part of Europe, it's not Middle Eastern tradition or Central European tradition. I, I, actually, I would, wouldn't know what it is. Here is, I would say that we have Eastern tradition, and this is a specific tradition of non-conformism, which now makes it easy to be uh, in the in, to, to, to make it, it, it makes it easier for Poles to understand Ukrainians and to be active advocates of Ukrainians, and also it's easier maybe not to understand Russians, but at least to find the. And to try to build a bridge with Russian nonconformists, and they had always a beautiful tradition of nonconformists. My last point would be an introduction to, to Boris, uh, and, and it, it, it comes from my previous point. Boris is an author of the book that we had a pleasure uh, to publish. Uh, the Zone of Transition would be the English translation, authorized by Boris uh, 10 minutes ago. Um, and this is a, this, and his main point, or one of the most spectacular points of this book, is also uh, uh, elaborated on the axis between West and East. I, what I, I mean is this kind of uh, disappointment or surprise that what was so engaging and what, what was so impressive from the Western perspective about the Eastern nonconformists, dissidents, intellectuals. All of it, after 1989, went in a completely reversed way. So in, we, or like, you know, Eastern European intellectuals, uh, instead of being, again, sovereign in the intellectual and political way, turned out to be a children imitating uh, in the most, let's say, uh, not maybe primitive, but also sometimes even primitive way, what was a mainstream in the West. I must say that uh, when I saw the title of this topic, which is Eastern Central Europe, I couldn't believe my eyes, because uh, this is uh, uh, the concept I was dealing with and working on Precisely 30 years ago, there are sometimes, you know, positive effects of being a little bit older. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, uh, I have some sort of knowledge, general knowledge, about this concept. Uh, its history, its meaning, and I can give you uh, very quickly, out of my memory, 30 years old memory, um, sort of introduction into the concept of Middle East Europe, uh, which is very interesting. I think that these concepts, including the concepts of East and West, are very dangerous concepts, and especially dangerous for the left, 
dealing with these concepts. And what I'm going now to tell you is sort of warning. Warning in using, dealing with these concepts. But before, all, uh, before I start, I would like to remind you all of a beautiful sentence Antonio Gramsci wrote in his prison notebooks that every place on earth is equally west and east, equally north and south. It is always, it is always the cultural concept and ideological appropriation of places, spaces, or, which is better to say, time spaces, which makes, which make this this, uh, this place being in, in our use, East and West, in normative terms. West is better than East, we all agree. <laughs> and if we even don't agree, the hegemonic ideology knows it. Because East is generally defined as a belated form of the West. But be before uh, we start to discuss these concepts, let, let me go back to, to, to the initiation, uh, to, to the time of my intellectual initiation. This is former Yugoslavia, Zagreb, what is today Croatia. It is the beginning of the 80s. At that time, in that quite liberal, uh, intellectual and cultural scene in former Yugoslavia, suddenly there was a new fashion. And at that time, fashions were coming from, of course, the West. New intellectual fashion, the fashion called Middle, Middle Europe. It was especially ac uh, accepted by some of most prominent at that time East European dissidents. George Conrad, Milan Kundera, wrote both immediately big essays on the Middle Europe. Uh, later, Maria Todorova, in, in, in her book Imagining the Balkans, from a historical perspective, uh, looked at this concept very critically and defined the concept as being a sort of um, secondary uh, concept helping at that time people to imagine another form of divide beyond the, you know, the, the, the Cold War divide, beyond the, the divide of the, of the Iron Curtain. Because Middle Europe uh, consisted not only of the Eastern European Middle Europe, of at that time Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, and so, and, and so on, which were uh, at the time part of the military Warsaw Pact bloc and the Soviet, uh, Soviet part of, of, of Europe, but also of, of the Western part, including, including uh, not only Aus Austria, but southern part of Germany, Bavaria, including Italy, Trieste, for instance, very important, the port of Middle Europe on the, on the south. South Sea, and including at that time non-aligned, at least parts of non-aligned, non-aligned uh, uh, Yugoslavia, which was neither uh, west on the west side nor or, or on, on the east side. But at the same time, I could immediately see how the concept started to produce new divides and new exclusions. The at that time relative liberal cultural elite liked very much <laughs> the, the concept, but started to use the concept of Middle uh, Europe to produce a new divide, a new border between the Balkans, between the South, the primitive South, and the developed, in former Yugoslavia, developed Middle European North. Like divide was, you know, Croatia, and, and, and um, uh, Croatia and Slovenia, including Vojvodina, which is northern Serbia, were part of the Middle Europe, 
while Bosnia and especially Muslims, uh, Albanians, Macedonians were part of the Balkans. And, and in, in, in their uh, imagination and in, in their, their dealing with the concept, this cultural elite produced quickly, immediately, uh, the concepts of, of racistic uh, exclusion. I remember how they suddenly started to, uh, to talk about Balkan culture in, in, in Zagreb, culture of, of cakes, of cakes, you know, Turkish cakes, which are not part of our middle European culture, a culture we share with Vienna and, and Budapest. The concept of, of Middle East Europe um, is a concept of an area, of a region, of an identity normative block. As I said, cultural container. You can put whatever you want into this container and claim that it is based on certain values, on certain features. Which is, of course, you know, voluntarily. This is, uh, <laughs> this is like a question, what are European values? Or what are the Western values? What are Eastern values? Who is to define these values? Are these values uh, something essential or something historical? Could they change? Do they change? Can we change them? These are open questions, but as, uh, again, uh, just, just to repeat it, um, these concepts, and these concepts have also, just always think of it, these are concepts uh, always have, in, 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 in the way how they are generated, the logic of the territorialization of values. Would you think that certain value must have its territory? So, this is sort of general introduction just to remind you that the concept is not new, that it has its history, it has its problems, conceptual problems, but whether the concept is of any use, politically, ideologically, culturally, and especially if it is of any use for, for a left politics of any sort, this is something we, we, can, we, can, we can really discuss.